Hey folks, Scott Weingar here, and this is the MCRID Podcast, Podcast 173. This is going to be a talk I have given to audiences at Grand Rounds over the past decade, and I've refrained from putting it up on the podcast because I wanted to have something I could talk about that no one had heard on the podcast. But now we're going to end that embargo. Today, we're going to talk about the laryngoscope as a murder weapon, oxygenation kills. And I think this is probably going to be a two-parter. We'll see how it plays out, but that's my guess. Um, so uh, amongst the two parts, what we will discuss is pre-oxygenation, pre-oxygenation in patients with shunt, uh, preventing deoxygenation, and re-oxygenation. Let's get right to it. You know the series by now, right? Every time you pick up a laryngoscope, you're being given a license to kill. And how you go about using that depends on how much you care about your patients. It's my contention that peri-intubation deaths are preventable. That when you show up to an M&M on a patient who died immediately after your intubation and claim the patient was really sick, you're trying to unfairly shunt the blame. Because the reasons patients decompensate are both predictable and preventable. Pretty much everything I cover is in the article that Rich Levitan and I wrote in the Annals of Emergency Medicine. And that article and all of the root evidence for the things we're going to discuss is at mcrit.org slash preox. So what's this series, The Laryngoscope is a Murder Weapon, all about? It's about the hop killers. You know, we have many prediction schemes, very few of which actually work, for predicting anatomically difficult airways. Uh, but very little talk has been given to something I've been fighting for recognition about for my entire career, which is the physiologically difficult airway. And maybe the reason why people don't talk about it very much is we don't have an acronym. You know, we have LEMON for difficult intimation and various other things for difficult BVM, difficult superglottic, difficult crike. They all have acronyms. Acronyms seem to be the, uh, the currency of having recognition in the emergency and critical care airway world. So I created a acronym for physiologically difficult airways. And that's HOP. Why HOP? Because I like beer. And so the HOP killers are what put you down in the peri-intubation from physiology problems. And so the HOP killers are hemodynamics, oxygenation, and low pH. Hemodynamics, patient who's in shock, hypotensive, or about to be just barely compensating. You come along, you give them a standard induction, they die. Low pH, severe metabolic acidosis, being compensated for by respiratory alkalosis. You take away the respiratory alkalosis patient codes. I cover those two in other places on the podcast. Today, what we're going to talk about is oxygenation kills. Patient who has shunted alveoli, and then we think it's a good idea to do a standard pre or no pre at all, and then are surprised when the SATs go from 85 to 52 in the span of five seconds in the patient codes. So let's talk oxygenation. Let's talk about a case. 30-year-old female overdose on methadone, heroin, and Ativan. You folks probably never see these patients in your neck of the woods. Patients have tunded, but the saturation's fine. On a crappy nasal cannula, not at 15, but at like 3 liters per minute, patient's satting just fine, but not managing secretions well. That's the thing. Patient has drool pooling out of her mouth. So you're intubating not for oxygenation, but for airway protection. We'll talk about this first. Just how you would pre-oxygenate a patient who's purely an airway protection issue. All right, so let's talk pre-ox. Ben Yamoff took some data from the anesthesia world that had already been published and put it together in a very nice uh, graph. And when you look at this, you see the time to go from 100% SAT to 90% SAT in the OR in... Um, Patients with normal or quote-unquote normal um, situations, it, it's a long time. It's, it's eight minutes or so in, in this uh, set of patients. Eight minutes to go from 100 to 90. Like you could have like 15 attempts within that before the patient ever got to any significant desaturation. Now it gets a bit worse for a moderately ill. Now you got to remember, this is moderately ill but still going to the OR. So the patient probably had some hangnails or something of that ilk. I'm just messing with you. Um, but a moderately ill adult still took five minutes to go from 100 to 90. Crazy. 
And the worst adult desaturators, the morbidly obese, um, you still had two and a half minutes. This is all of it, even the morbidly obese adult, is more time than we usually see in the regular ED patient before they desaturate from 100 to 90. So what's going on here? Well, this is predicated on normal hemodynamics, which our patients rarely have, and then perfect preoxygenation, which we rarely do. We could easily affect that second one, and it's a little bit more difficult, but we can affect the first one as well. But let's talk about that second one, perfect preoxygenation. So how do we or how should we preoxygenate? Well, the board exam answer, and this may have changed because I think people are getting savvier to this stuff, but the board exam answer is you put the patient on 100% non-rebreather. Now, the problem with that is that these devices don't exist in the wild. And I've been told by listeners that there actually is one of these devices out there, and I'm blanking on the commercial name. I don't own them, but that actually are 100% or near to it non-rebreathers. And those probably are far more effective than the things we actually have, which are these things. And the problem with these things is they're not a non-rebreather, and therefore do not provide close to 100% FiO2. And the reason is they have holes. And if you look at one side of the device, the side opposite the red arrow, there's a little rubber gasket there. And if you look at the side where the red arrow is pointing, and this is like this in everyone I've seen in the United States at least, um, there's a place that uh, that gasket should be, but it's just not there. It's not in the, in the packaging with that third gasket, because there's another one right at the auction inlet source. And if you were to take a gasket from another mask and put it there, this device becomes far more effective and far closer, though not still perfect, far closer to 100% and far closer to non-rebreather status. So then the question is, why is this gasket missing? And the answer, if you thought about it for a second, you'd figure out. Without that gasket, the patients don't asphyxiate when they get disconnected from oxygen, and with it, they very well might. And so the trade-off of good preoxygenation versus dying patients, uh, it's pretty easy to see which one a hospital would pick. I don't recommend modifying your own to make a true non-rebreather because, again, you're really screwed if you take a manufacturer supply device, muck it up, and then the patient dies. That's like doubly worse than having the patient die from a out-of-the-box manufacturer device. So I don't recommend doing that. But if you did, it's much more effective. And if you buy that commercial device, which, again, I'm blanking on the name, that's a true 100% because it has uh, pure one-way valves everywhere, that actually gives a much higher FiO2. So I just call these reservoir face masks, because that's what they actually are. They're just a face mask with a reservoir. They provide around 60% FiO2, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. At And this is at the 15 liter per minute, which is the max in most places. It's the max the flow meters most places go up to. Um, so that's what you're getting. Not 100, not even 90. 90 would be pretty good. I'd take 90 on any device, but 60. You can fix this. You could fix this by underneath it, putting a nasal cannula at 15 liters per minute. Now, all of a sudden, there's going to be this outroar amongst the savvier members of my audience, but they're not savvy enough. And the outroar is, oh, there's been four recent trials and blah, 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 and nasal cannulas don't work. No, you're wrong. And I will do a we explaining why um, those studies don't show this at all. And that if you really think that, you probably just read the abstract. Because if you read the studies, I think you'd come to the same conclusions I did. But a nasal cannula at 15 liters with that last part underlined in your head um, has not been studied. And if you extrapolate the studies that are there, I think you will see that it is a very good thing to add to a non-rebreather. And the two in combo probably get you pretty damn close to the best you could do, if not actually right up at the same level as the best you could do. Now, I saw no downsides to this. They're cheap, they're easy, they're safe. There was an article in Annals of Emergency Medicine demonstrating the safety of nasal cannula at 15. Um, my friend Min Lakan keeps chiming in with the one true objection, which is if you're in the pre-hospital environment, running two devices at 15 liters per minute will very rapidly burn your oxygen stores. I hear you, Min. I'm not a pre-hospitalist. I have unlimited oxygen. So this is not an issue for me. It's definitely a valid issue for pre-hospital folks. All right. Once you have on a non-rebreather, and a nasal cannula, both at 15 liters. Then they need three minutes of tidal volume breathing, meaning their normal breathing, whatever they're doing, at least, or eight vital capacity breaths, meaning maximal exhalation, maximum inhalation, repeat time seven. Very rarely do our patients cooperate with that latter strategy, so I usually use the former. The only time I care about the eight vital capacity breaths is I'm about to do a sedation and what I will do is tell the patient, take the eight biggest breaths you can because they're fully cooperative. That's why I'm doing a procedural sedation on them as opposed to them being intubated because they're obtunded and near dead. 
So that's fine for pre-oxygenation in a sedation, but for an intubation, three minutes is what you want. Meaning you put it on early, you leave it on, you don't touch it, you don't futz around with it and let them breathe room air again because then they fully screwed up the denitrogenation, which is what you really want to accomplish here. And I, I didn't have it in this lecture because it gets complicated, but you guys are smart. You could take a little complication. Uh, what I've done with Rich in the article and in all my teachings is broken up the concept of pre oxygenation for which I use the term to refer to getting up to at least 95% sap before you give your RSI meds, and denitrogenation, which really has nothing that could be measured on an oxygen saturation, but uh, implies that you've washed out as much nitrogen as possible from the lungs, and preferably the blood, though that really doesn't matter as much as the lungs. Um, you've gone as far as you could go. And the two, while linked physiologically, are not really linked operationally. So you could have a patient with a 70% sat who you've maximally denitrogenated, and you could have a patient with 100% sat who you've not denitrogenated at all. And they're both incredibly essential, um, but they do not imply each other. So the three minutes buys me denitrogenation, and we'll talk about what to do for pre-oxygenation when a patient's not getting up to greater than 95 with just this non root breather and nasal cannula in just a minute. All right, what position should you pre-oxygenate in? And uh, in my opinion, that position should be semi-fowlers, meaning uh, not flat, not supine, but head of the bed up, 30, 45 degrees, probably 30 is the best trade-off between uh, being able to keep them in the same position for pre oxygenation and intubation. But uh, this has been looked at, and the patients get less atelectasis, better pre oxygenation longer time to desaturation. There's three articles here at the bottom of this slide. I think you'll probably find others. And this position also optimal for intubation. Best glottic exposure, 20 or 30 degree head up. If they're in um, spinal immobilization, if you still think that's a good thing, it's probably not. You probably could bend even a trauma patient up to 20 or 30 degrees head up with a lumbar fracture. In the settings of confirmed lumbar fracture, that's usually the instructions we put in the nurse's orders. We say uh, do no greater than 20 or 30 degree head up or something similar to that. And so you could do it in those guys. But if they're still on a backboard, you can't. So put them in reverse Trendelenburg. Okay. What about the BVM? The BVM is not bad if you understand how it works. Most BVMs out there that are cheap, which means most of the BVMs the hospitals buy, do not have a one-way valve on the exhalation port. What this means is the device works perfectly when you're squeezing the bag, forcing breaths in, uh, and works horribly for spontaneous ventilation because the patient will be breathing room air. It's easier for them to get the air from the environment than it is from the bag and reservoir portion. So they'll be breathing an FiO2 somewhere close to 21%. Not good. There are ways to alter the BVM to give 100%. You could buy one with uh, one-way valves on both the inhalation and exhalation port, or you could put a PEEP valve, even at zero, over the exhalation port. And that also, in the bags I have uh, access to, will uh, act as a one-way valve and give 100%. Now, if you want to do this, understand you need to maintain a perfect two-hand seal during the entire denitrogenation period, or else it's going to be uh, worse than perhaps the slightly lower FiO2 of the nasal cannula and non-rebreather combination. You could either do this by tightly holding the mask to the patient's face with two hands, or um, you could hook your BVM up to a non-invasive mask that has the straps and is made to strap to the patient's face, or you could use the anesthesia-style mask straps on the mask of a BVM. It's often augmented to have a separation between the bag and the mask portion of the BVM. There is some tubing that's manufactured specifically for this purpose um, that makes this even easier. But the combination of straps, a mask, and a separation makes this a very viable device. And as you'll see shortly, having the ability to dial up that P-valve and give uh, CPAP is really nice as well. I would still use the nasal cannula underneath provided that is the thin, cheap, crappy nasal cannulas, because these don't affect the mask seal. But um, the folks down at the Sydney HEMS service studied this, and if there's any mask leak, as in you're not perfect, or the patient moves their cheeks a little bit and gets a leak, the nasal cannula will augment. And this has also been studied on anesthesia circuits. So I would argue if you're going to use the BVM, you still use the nasal cannula at 15. Um, this solves some of the waste of a pre-hospital situation because um, you're not, oh, maybe it doesn't. It depends, I think, on your BVM as to whether it's continuously putting 
the excess oxygen into the environment or not. And I imagine most of them do. All right, scratch that. Don't do this if you're in Min Le Kong's world. But in any other world, and perhaps that's the safer world, um, a nasal cannula under a BVM, both at 15, works quite wonderfully for pre-oxygenation as well. Last way you could do, uh, we talked about it on the show a few weeks ago, but you use the ventilator or a non-invasive machine, but I prefer the ventilator over the patient's face with a mask, either non-invasive mask or a BVM mask, hooked up to the ventilator tubing with a nasal cannula underneath, and that works just swell as well. Let's talk case two. Case two, 55-year-old male, bilateral pneumonia, patient's drowsy, on a nasal cannula at 74%, uh, on a nasal cannula it gets a 74% sat, so you put on a non-rebreather on top of it and it only comes up to 82. Well, that's not good. You could, and most people would on their board exams, Say, when you have this patient 82% with the non rebreather what do you do? You perform RSI, rapid sequence intubation. you got no choice. Uh, you'll have to bag them up in the peri and post-intubation. This sounds to me like an exceedingly bad idea. This device, ill-suited in its current form, and I told you we'll tell, teach you how to augment that in a second, but in its, in its unaltered form, really crappy for intubating this patient 82% on a non rebreather Chances are good. Instead of coming up, they'll go down. And essentially what you're doing is you're gambling. Not at Vegas, not in Atlantic City, that dreg of the world, Um, but in the hospital with a patient's life. That doesn't seem like good odds to me, so I don't like doing it. So in order to figure out a better way, you need to understand hypoxemia. And if you ask any pulmonary critical care fellow, they probably have this tattooed to their inner arm, but these are the five, there's actually six, but we won't talk about that one right now, five causes of hypoxemia. Hypoventilation, meaning the patient's just not taking any breaths. They've done a really nice batch of fentanyl-laced heroin, and they've stopped breathing. Inadequate environmental oxygen, meaning they're on top of Everest or they're in a closed-spaced environment. VQ mismatching. They are not getting enough cardiac flow to match their ventilation, and so that, that's causing them problems. Diffusion abnormality, alveolar basement membranes effed up. Um, and then shunt. And the nice thing about this list for resuscitation doctors is the only one that matters is shunt. Why do I say that? If you put a patient on greater than 50% FiO2, all the others basically disappear. And what you're left with is pure physiologic or anatomical, but we're going to talk about physiologic shunt. Shunt is what kills your patients in the peri-intubation from an oxygenation perspective. Shunt deserves respect. Shunt is what's going to get you m and m So let's understand physiologic shunt. Okay, so normal alveoli, oxygen comes in. Blood comes in at 70%, gets oxygenated, goes out at 100. In a physiologically shunted alveoli, because there's fluid or pus or the alveoli is atelectatic, blood goes in at 70, comes out at 70. No matter how much you increase the FiO2, doesn't change that at all. So that's a problem. What's the solution? The solution to shunt is mean airway pressure. Mean airway pressure. What does that mean? It means the time you spend a greater than zero peep. Greater than zeep. That stands for zero peep, though you'll never use that term. You need positive airway pressure. And where you need it is really between breaths. Um, But continuous positive airway pressure is just fine for a spontaneously breathing patient. So CPAP becomes the pre technique of choice. Now, why can't you just bag them up? Why doesn't the bag work? Well, the bag is not providing any significant mean airway pressure that matters. Here's what happens with the bag. You squeeze the bag, and you get this spike that lasts half a second of high airway pressure. That's not a good way to open alveoli. But even if it did, even if it managed to open one of the alveoli, uh, between breaths, it goes back to zeep, zero peep, and immediately closes down. And each time it opens and then closes, and you try to open it again, it becomes harder. Um, this is called atelectotrauma. The alveoli stick together. You never want them to close. So BVM ventilation doesn't work. Here's a video from George Kovach demonstrating that. Go. All right, and we're going to put the peep valve on. Set at 10. So if that doesn't work, what does work? Well, what works is between breaths, whether spontaneous, negative, inspiratory pressure, or positive, to keep 
the airway pressure, the mean airway pressure above the closing pressure of the alveoli. Now, you could do this with a ventilator or non-invasive machine, and that's how I like to do it. But for that, you need a ventilator in the ED, and you need to be able to put the patient on the non-invasive positive pressure, the non-invasive CPAP yourself, meaning you need a mask, you need tubing, and you need to know how to work the ventilator. Now, most people can't do that. Most people don't have access to a vent. Even if they did, all the supplies are kept in a locked cabinet. You don't have the key to. What else could you do? Well, if you don't have a vent, you could use this, the P-valve I had mentioned earlier. The P-valve fits on the fits on the exhalation port of every BVM out there I've seen. And you just dial it in. This one's 0 to 20. Some of them go up to 30. Um, and you dial in the peep you want. And when the patient expires against it, they have to expire greater than the strain pressure of that spring in order to exhale. Otherwise, um, they're not able to breathe out, and that keeps the pressure high. It keeps it at whatever you set it to. Now, this becomes kind of brilliant. Um, the problem with this is it's not true high-flow CPAP. Because uh, if the patient's generated exhalation is not enough to pressure the valve, then there's no pressure in the airway. And eventually, the pressure dissipates between breaths. Um, if the patient's breathing rapidly, it's probably okay. If they're breathing slowly, then it's not good enough. Unless you've done what I've asked and have a nasal cannula at 15 liters per minute underneath, which is more than enough flow to power the peep valve, to keep the pressure at whatever you set it at, regardless of whether the patient's apneic or taking slow breaths or taking quick breaths. So that's the reason I advocate having nasal cannula underneath because it will pressurize your CPAP, make it high flow CPAP and make it effective all throughout the peri-intubation. Now, again, you need that same perfect two hand mask seal or the mask straps that I had recommended earlier because BVM peep valve, maybe that uh, interposing corrugated tubing between the bag portion and the mask, and mask straps, my gosh, this is, with a nasal cannula underneath, at least as good as dragging the machine over, except for the oxygen you burn. So this is kind of great, kind of cheap, and if you put a nasal cannula and a peep valve in your pocket when you go to intubate that patient at CT or on the floor, you're helping out, all of a sudden, because they always have a BVM and they always have oxygen there. Uh, all of a sudden, you can put a nasal cannula on, you can put the BVM on, and boom! Patient has perfect pre-oxygenation, perfect re-oxygenation, perfect everything, uh, and you don't need to drag machinery to that patient's bedside. And as I keep mentioning, mass straps are really cool. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go to any of your anesthesia friends and say, hey, can you show me or maybe give me one of the disposable sets of mass straps so I could have them and use them and wipe them down between patients because they're not contracting anything where there could be a exposure. I don't know. Use your hospital's local policy for that. But I, I, I think it's fine to wipe these down with those same things we wipe down the, uh, the B, P cuffs and all that, you know, those horribly detrimental to your skin wipes. Um, but, you know, use your hospital policy. Don't get fired from anything I say. Okay, and I can't belabor this enough, but for all of these techniques, nasal cannula at 15 liters per minute augments the technique. And these are just some of the many trials out there. I have even more at mcrit.org slash preoxygenation, but many trials out there demonstrating that CPAP makes preoxygenation better, longer time until desaturation, uh, better uh, um, blood gases, after intubation, blah, blah, blah. And they, they point out one group specifically, which is in the morbidly obese patient, even if you could get their SATs up nice and high, greater than 95% with standard pre technique, you should really consider using the CPAP pre CPAP pre because um, they desaturate regardless of what their initial SAT is. Because just the fact that their enormous chest walls and bellies are pushing on their lungs, they get atelectatic and desaturate very quickly, and CPAP may ameliorate that, that rapid desaturation. Whew. Okay. I guess we'll, we'll do deox, and then uh, we'll stop there, and we'll do the rest next week or two weeks from now. Let's talk about preventing deoxygenation. And that ties into one of my favorite topics, apneic oxygenation. And so how do you prevent desaturation during the apneic period? Now, I've talked about this on the podcast extensively. We've talked about all sorts of studies about it, so let's just go over it quickly. This was a study done in the 1950s, VA alleged volunteers, and they took them to the OR, and they did um, surgeries with the patients paralyzed, so they're not breathing on the anesthesia circuit, but with the anesthesia ventilator not turned on, and these patients got profoundly 
hypercarbic and profoundly acidotic, but didn't desaturate. Why? Um, because just the act of being exposed to flow during their intubation was enough for them to suck oxygen passively into their alveoli and not desaturate. This has since been repeated with the Thrive study, uh, I think in far better methodologic fashion. Same thing. In patients with healthy lungs going for elective operations, they could aptly oxygenate ad infinitum until limited by their pH. And seemingly in the high flow O2 of the Thrive trial, they didn't even get particularly hypercarbic because that probably has the ability to aptly ventilate patients as well. So the, the concept is decidedly sound in patients who have the absence of physiologic shunt. So we've explained what apneic oxygenation is. Your alveoli continue to draw stuff in passively because the alveoli are putting oxygen to the hemoglobin passing by. That creates a tiny little vacuum within the alveoli that could suck down things from your uh, tracheobronchial tree. And as long as you have a patent glottis and a patent airway, uh, you continue to oxygenate. Um, here's just a few of the studies. Now, um, if you've seen the podcast, you know there's been studies also contradicting this in critically ill patients. Um, and the reason for those contradictions have been covered. Um, the main reason is that if they have physiologic shunt, it doesn't work unless you also fix the physiologic shunt. The other reasons are you need to maintain a patent airway. And perhaps the most important reason is if you're going to be ventilating the patient during their apneic period, there is no benefit to apneic oxygenation above that because you don't need apneic oxygenation if you're getting actual oxygenation that is preventing you from becoming apneic. So if you bag that patient four times during the 60 seconds of your rock effect, um, there's no gain to apneic oxygenation. And some of you may choose to do that. Some of you are more in my camp, which says that when I teach people how to do this, many of them bag badly, and I'd rather do it with a nasal cannula and a peep valve than bagging. But if you think you're safe to bag and you know to give tiny breaths very infrequently, then there's no benefit to apneic oxygenation over the ventilation of the patient safely during the apneic period. Hope I got that across well enough. All right, and this was the randomized controlled trial uh, that compared 0, 5, and 10. For some reason, this is still in abstract form, which makes me leery, um, as opposed to being a full publication, but it demonstrated better at 5 than 0 and better at 10 than 5. How should we do this if you want to do it? Um, leave them on the non-rebreather slash reservoir face mask. Put a nasal cannula underneath, which you should have already done at, for my mind, 15 liters per minute. We know it's safe. We know it's better than zero, better than five, better than 10. And you probably want an oxygen tank because you want something to hook up your third thing that provides oxygen, which is non-rebreather on one, BV almond on the second, and nasal cannula on the third in whatever order you like. You can get away with needing three sources simply by using the BVM with the nasal cannula underneath. That's only two sources. Or as mentioned, you get away with all of this just... Um, with a ventilator, if you set that ventilator to give breaths during the apneic period, then you need none of these. But since there's usually a chance the mass seal is not going to be perfect, you're still better off with a nasal cannula underneath, which means you need one oxygen source and a ventilator, um, and you'll get the job done. All right, then you push your meds. At that point, you might as well take off the non-rebreather mask. But if you're using apneic CPAP, because the patient has physiologic shunt, then don't take off the BVM mask. Leave the BVM with the PEEP valve on. Don't take off the ventilator mask if you're going to use uh, CPAP on the vent. And don't take off the non-invasive mask if you're using a non-invasive machine for CPAP, because apneic oxygenation does not work without apneic CPAP in a patient with physiologic shunt. And I'm only hitting these things time and time again because they're so damn important. And then you need to maintain a pain and airway, or this doesn't work because the patient's glottis structures close down and there's no gas getting to their uh, tracheobronchial tree. So you need to do a big, big jaw thrust with the patient in a head tilt, chin lift position, uh, unless they're in spinal precautions, in which case just do the jaw thrust. And again, I'll say it, if they need a peep to pre-ox, they'll need peep to ap-ox. All right, and here's just showing you can use a variety of devices, both mechanical and um, non-moving part CPAP devices or a ventilator. Here's my resident with a BVM with a corrugated tubing with a nasal cannula underneath and a peep valve hooked up to the BVM you can't see in this picture, and we demonstrate that it does indeed. In the He holds his breath in the next video, and the, the CPAP stays the same because the nasal cannula is providing more than enough flow to power the peep valve. Yeah. All right, start holding your breath. That's it. 
So there it is, 15 centimeters of water. He's apneic. All right. Can't hold his breath very long, but you get the point. All right. If there's any questions, put these in the show notes at mcrit.org 173 uh, for these first two parts, the preox and deox segments, and I'll be happy to answer them. Check out more information at mcrit.org slash preox or mcrit.org slash preoxygenation, and I hope to hear from you soon. Scott Weingart, MCRIT Podcast, saying bye-bye. <laughs>